we were looking at the screen from the rounded Apple computer. It is broken. It's got stuff going on inside there, you can see, because of the cracks in the glass. And we noticed this one has an LED backlight, not cold cathode fluorescent like the others. I managed to get the bits of stuff off the connector where that broke when I was disconnecting it. But that doesn't really matter because the plug didn't match. So we can't put a screen from the other older computers onto the computer that this one came from. But anyway, let's have a look at the LEDs inside here. And let's also look at how the LED driver works. Got here some data from a Rome LED driver. It works similarly to the one that the Apple computer uses, uh, but it has a block diagram that's a bit easier to see what's going on here. For each of the eight channels that this has, there's this circuit here, which the current flows from the boost converter through the LEDs, and then from each chain of LEDs into one of these sinks. And for each one, there is a little FET and a comparator or op-amp and a current sensing resistor down to ground. As current flows through there, voltage will be produced across the resistor and then that is balanced against a reference voltage which is set by these pins here for what current you want to have flowing through the LEDs and it will turn on this FET to some degree to balance the demand for current against the voltage there that's developed by the actual current flowing. So it will regulate the current for every chain to the same current, even if their LED forward voltages are slightly different. For the dimming or setting the brightness of the LEDs, there's a switch there. So it will switch the reference on and off, which will have the effect of switching the current flow on and off. So that's how that works, multi strings of LEDs. So let's look at the LEDs by taking them out of this screen. Since the screen is broken, it doesn't matter that we're going to take it apart. So I notice there's some more screws here. There's also lots of tape on everything. Probably going to end up ripping some ribbon cables, aren't we? As soon as we take this off, because then the board will become free. I suspect there might be some connectors under here. I think we need to take it off from this end. Peel it all back. No, that's no good, is it? Oh, we can do it like that. That little last bit. Okay, that's peeled off. Now what have we got? A board. Now there's two connections for the display data. One there, one there. And I think this one here will be the LEDs. It's got one thick for the power and then the six, I think it was, for the return. And I'm not sure what that chip does there. Presumably that will be to do with display voltages, producing the voltages. There's a chip there that looks like it might be an LED driver. I'll have to look that up and see what that is. Okay, I wasn't able to find what this AUO chip is, but I presume it's something to do with LCD panels, but this one here, similarly, it's AAT1167, and that's a T integrated TFT LCD power solution, so it's a switch mode converter for LCDs. Anyway, let's see if we can pull this off. Seems like it's all just taped together. Let me just pull it apart. Otherwise we're going to rip it off, because the backlight is separate to the display panel. Now oh, that's taped down. Ah, okay, we just ripped through the cable. Anyway, so there wasn't any point of, you know, the act of peeling the tape off just ripped through the cable. So here are these layers of stuff that you get inside LCD screens, like we saw on the previous video. Same sort of deal. And... Now... The Perspex thing, the diffuser, which is, looks like that one's more or less a constant thickness, and then the back bit. And then in the bottom of here should be a row of LEDs. Yeah, we can see them there. It's just a row of LEDs instead of the tube. Let me pull this frame out. So we can see them there. It's the whole bunch of white LEDs all the way along. Can we get them out? There's a fold of metal over the top and there's also tape there. Peel the tape off. We should be able to slide the board out without destroying it too much. Oh, it's a shame that we 
And the connector got ripped off. So they made the pads big on it. It will be for heat sinking to help couple the heat into the metal frame. It's a multi-layer board. Lots of stuff going on. Lots of white LEDs, there you go. Which is uh, difficult to turn on now because we broke that connector. I was thinking before we could have connected it to its control board and back to the computer motherboard and then powered it up to see if we can get them to turn on. But we can't do that now. Okay, we'll move on to the main event of this final part, third part video series. We have a an NEC, one of these things, a, a netbook. That's right, that's really weak computers that hardly did anything slow and annoying so it's got this power supply it's yeah 19 volt 3.4 amps it's got a nice two pin connector because it comes from japan and it's good and they know how to do power systems properly so two pin much better let's turn this on and see what it does presumably it does something there's lights on go operating system not found so there's no drive in it at the moment but um Probably a BIOS we can go in. It's one of those stupid keyboards where it has function where it should have control so you have to be careful when doing anything with it because you end up pushing the function key when you're supposed to be pushing the control using your muscle memory. Let's see if we can get into BIOS. It's either going to be delete or F1 or escape. Maybe it's F10. Oh I don't know what it is. Let's see if I can work it out. Here we go. Got into the BIOS. It's all in Japanese so it's quite difficult to <laughs> to use. So it's a 1.6 gigahertz Atom CPU, so not particularly hard out. And it's just like a regular BIOS except I can't read most of it. That's hyper-threading. How do you know if that's enabled or disabled? What are you going to boot off? Yeah, so the battery comes out and under that the slot for the drive. I've got a drive here which I think has Windows 11 on it. Or it might have Windows 10 on it, I don't know, but we might as well try it out just to see something, anything before we take this computer apart. It's it's not a very good computer because it's so slow, it's pretty much completely useless. Any netbook that was ever produced is... Oh, we'll see if it can boot this. No, it either isn't connected properly. Or it doesn't like that drive for some reason. Well, it is pushed in far enough to line up with those screws there, so I think it's in. It feels like it's plugging in. Oh, look, it's doing something this time. Well, wow, it's flashing a cursor instead of saying operating system not found. Hard disk light's not on, though. Mm, yeah, I don't think this is going to be successful. It's probably too old to boot that. Uh, perhaps we should look inside this battery though. Give it a bit of a twist. Cracked it open. It's opening. And it was opening. Get some more screwdrivers. It's not going to just pop open like that other one did. Okay, it's opening. So there's three cells. Probably could have determined that from the outside without taking it apart. I glued it in real tight. NCR. That national cash registers. Probably not. These were holding a little bit of charge. But I think it's pretty wrecked because this computer's just sat unused for several years. When did I get it? Uh, probably three, four years ago. Got five mega ohm resistor there. I put glue over the exciting parts of the board so you can't see it. Oh well. Very well spot welded on there. Okay, I'll put this in the recycling as well. That's the battery. Presumably that drive still works. I don't know, I haven't used it for a while. How is this held together? There are some screws and the Philips or JIS type. 
this JIS one that's nicely that is screw already taken out it appears to be so this thing is supposed to be good for Windows 7 but that's a big burden on a very poor performing Atom I had a look on the website and they only released Windows 7 drivers for this computer there was no other drivers you could get so a bit disappointing I thought I could put a more efficient operating system like Windows 2000 on it but they don't release any drivers for anything other than Windows 7 so yeah wasn't likely to be successful I wonder what comes apart on this ah the keyboard comes out that's cunning look at that and I've got a cable that's long enough you can get it out unlike that Apple one it's quite a nice keyboard although it's in the annoying layout seems like Japan copied the UK in their horrible layout instead of copying the and basing theirs off of the US layout the more normal one I wonder what sort of RAM this thing has got I wonder if the BIOS would have told us that possibly the summary screen did but didn't actually look at that the wire for the touchpad to take off take the touchpad out and have a look at it little metal plate ah. The buttons for the touchpad are on the main board, so they're not part of the assembly. And it doesn't seem to just push through like the other one did, so it's actually multiple layers there. Interesting, so that that board is not going to just pop out once you remove the bracket. Okay, we'll put that aside. We've got speakers. We get in a little bit closer. That they conveniently tell you it's Phillips with a little icon there. What have we got? Oh, what that is? Some kind of tape. What is it covering? Power supply looking business. Mac addresses and see what else there's the Wi-Fi card. We take that out, a little M PCI, whatever it's called. Little tiny thing. Intel, so not a bad one. And here display connector. So that's the little handle you can flip up to take it off pull up on that and probably these screws will release the hinges what is that ah that's the power connector so that's got a little bracket holding it down so the power connector is not part of the main board so that's quite good design unlike those hp computers so when you break off the power connector you can replace it fairly easily that's the screen come off yeah pretty good now the main board might come out soon how much room you have to remove for the drive ram must be on the other side then there's no other access things on the bottom. There's a screw here. So the board's getting retained by these connectors that protrude slightly through holes. And it's also being retained by the speaker wires. Pull that off. Uh, so that one wire goes to both speakers. Comes over to there, over there, under the board. There you go. Speakers. Little speakers, the wire tape down to the bottom, and that's it. There's one little oh, it's heat stake that's the security lock thing. It's a bit of sheet metal there, which is heat staked onto the bottom panel. That will just pop off. Recycle a small bit of metal. So they've got shielding on the bottom here by um, sprayed on conductive paint stuff, sort of copper colored, and then they've insulated that from the drive in case you put in a drive that's got an exposed circuit board so that won't short out it must be copper thin coating of copper sprayed into it and connects through the the plated pads where they touch the bottom so that's interesting put that out of the way now what have we got on the other side of the board the m SATA connector it's interesting that label has been squashed down by the heatsink bracket What's under here? Chip of some sort. What is that? Intel. Must be some kind of Northbridge type deal. The RAM we got in here, it's one gigabyte, and it's the same type that that more rounded Apple computer. Not the older one, so it's a slightly newer type. Let's have a look. Oh, that's the wrong way. These come out this way. Yeah, so it's the same connector there. They're probably the same type of modules. 1 gig 1 R8 PC3. Yeah, very similar. That's interesting. I wonder if they put this insulator tape down because 
RAM modules could have a conductive bit that touches the main board? Or is it because there's a version of this computer that has a window in the bottom and they don't want you seeing the circuit board? Let's take the fan and heat sink off and have a look under there. Is there another screw under there? Yes. So we'll take the fan out. No, I think that's just a heat spreader plate on the top. I think we can take it out from the bottom. Yeah. yeah, it's reasonably full of dust in there. Not as bad as that other computer though. And then should we put that back up there? So the power connector there, under that tape, that just plugs in so that it can get replaced if it's damaged. It's good. What was that joined onto? Studs that are soldered into the main board. And then we remove the heatsink from the CPU. Now these screws are not retained like the other ones were. I wonder if that's a speaker to do the beep. Looks like it could be. There's a little aperture there where the noise will come out. Wow, so they don't believe in heatsink paste. Ah, so to take the fan off, it would have been better to do the top screws. Let's take these off and see what it's doing. I think I have to get this tape off as well. Tape is off. At least it's sticky behind, of course. Yeah, there you go. So there's a bit of dust. Special Japan dust. Chuck that away. I don't really want that floating around. Yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah, so that's interesting. Little heat pipe going all the way around to a little tiny heat sink on the end. Although it's got this whole bit here, sort of adds to its heat sinking ability. Interesting. Okay, so there's the CPU. That's got a little insulating sheet around it as well. And it looks like it's got a bit of tape on the top of the chip as well. This is it interesting? Maybe we should peel that off as well. Might as well peel the stuff off. Here's the CPU. Little Atom CPU. Very weak. Kind of a waste of time it was making those. Especially for computers that they expect people to use. It's probably fine for some embedded stuff, but it doesn't really make for a useful computer for like everyday general purpose use. So is there anything else interesting on this board? CMOS battery, or RTC as they call it there. Yeah, so it's got this weird USB connector. I don't know what the deal is with that. Why have they got a mini B on there? Seems like you'd have to use one of those on-the-go type cables to use that as a USB port. Quite strange. The real tech chip there, so that'll be the wired Ethernet with the magnetics there. PLX, it seems like some kind of PCI bridge type thing. Maybe that's a soft bridge with the various bits and pieces on it. Then there's this ITE IT8502. I don't know what that is. It's a highly integrated and better controller with system functions suitable for system applications. Great. And real tech, so it'll be the sound stuff there. What is this thing? SLG8S. E5 clock synthesizer. Okay, so that's part of running the CPU and the other bits and pieces. I don't know what that is. Can't see what it says on here. Something micro OZ888 card reader. Okay. Oh, well, it's below the card reader chip, so that makes sense. That'll be the ROM. I don't know what that PLX thing is. NET2282 PCI to high speed USB 2. Okay, so that's the that's the USB chip. Really? You'd think that'd be integrated into the processor. I'm not sure I'm looking at the right thing. Don't know. Yeah, PCI USB IP controller. Let's have a look at that. There you go. NET2282. Pretty sure that's what that says. So it's a USB 2 controller. I don't know how many ports it's got. I don't know why this isn't part of the self bridge type thing. You know, we don't get all the full details. Maybe we should try looking up this Intel one. See what this thing here and see what its deal is. Well, it's CG82N, there's no B. So it's a chipset. I don't know if we can get a data sheet for it. Uh, it's a generic NM10 family chipset. Let's see if it has USB. It does say USB interface there. USB 2 enhanced host controller. Uh, so it looks like it does have some USB stuff in it, so I don't know why they've got that additional chip there for USB. Quite weird. So this thing is 600 pages, so... That's a little bit too advanced for what we're willing to deal with right now. Okay, so there's more USB ports from that. This is pretty good, well off of USB ports. I've got two there, whatever that weird one is. Another one on the other side here. And there's probably some internal devices that use USB. Maybe? Not sure, there's no webcam. Card reader has got its own special chip, so it might be a PCI one. PCIe, that was that thing there. Well, it could be on the USB. I'm interested to try and work out what this USB is for, but it tracks. Go through a filter, that's here. Goes through a filter, unpopulated inductor thing, and then disappears onto an internal layer. You can't see 
on the other side. Yeah, the external layers are taken up by this Ethernet stuff and some VGA business, which is probably the I squared C for the beaded stuff. Got various power supplies, some kind of switch mode there. Maxim IC for that, more switch mode stuff. Power supplies, probably battery charger. So the battery connects on there and the power connects there. New battery stuff fits on the bottom there. With inductor, it's probably something to do with the CPU. And this stuff here is probably CPU related. And you look at that row of bits there. That's probably a multi-channel power supply controller for the CPU. And that should come out since we've stopped pushing on it. It'll only just be stuck down by the tape. Wow. I'm bented. Wow, so it's really stuck down. I don't want that coming off. Use really good tape to hold that, and it's been under hard compression its whole life from the the CPU heatsink pulling on it. We're looking at power supplies. So you can see there's some tracks going to under the CPU there. Come from this section here with some wires. So comes to that part there. That's probably the main core voltage for the CPU coming off those caps from that inductor. And then there's some other little bits and pieces involved with those FETs. Oh, that's, that will be the other part of the power supply. It'll be switched by these FETs here. Their wires go through the inductor. On the other side of the inductor, we've got the caps there. And then off to the CPU. Perhaps we could look up this chip, see what its deal is. Very hard to read ones. ISL887. What is that? It's Renesis. SM bus level two battery charger. Really? Okay, well that makes sense because it is over there by the battery terminals. So yeah, that'll be the battery charger chip and it probably uses these FETs here. Looks like the tracks are going in that direction. So it'll be that inductor there. Caps. Little tiny fuse. Okay. So that's the battery charger. There's that business there. The AC adapter to system to battery. There's double FET thing, buck converter, current sensing through this resistor here so it can monitor the charge going into the battery. That's pretty good. So that means this one here, this Maxim chip, must be the one that controls the actual core voltage. Let's have a look at that. 8796G, one phase quick PWM, VID power supply controllers for Intel notebook CPUs and graphics. Very good. Do they have an example circuit? There you go. Core output there. Input 7 to 24 volts. Pretty good range so it can account for different types of batteries and when the AC adapter is connected. And then there's sensing inputs. So that's just another buck converter there. Two switches, the one that acts as the diode and the main switch. Inductor. And there's some monitoring there across the inductor. And there's voltage feedback. Another good switch mode controller. They must be running some fairly long gate wires. Well, it's not that long, is it? Yeah, you can see them there will be those. Those little tracks there will be going to the fit gates, I think. Maybe that's to drain some sort of feedback. Yep, so that's the core voltage power supply for the CPU. Awesome! Another little switch mode over there with those fits. Inductors, capacitor, probably from that chip there. Another little switch mode controller. This is 8116. Not sure if we can find a data sheet for this thing. Not sure about that, I'm not coming up with a, a good match. Um, so I think we're done with this main board. It's interesting, it's got various things on it. Good power supplies. A little bracket which helps hold the VGA connector so you don't snap it off accidentally when leaning on the plug. Very good. Should we have a look inside the screen? Probably quite difficult to get into. It'll be the usual thing where there's screws under these. Nothing to focus on. Push into them. Uh, probably these ones on the top here. Are these screws? Yep. These ones are a bit thicker because they're actually the things that the screen bumps down on when you close it. Very good. Ah, there's something in the hinge. Don't know. Not sure where to start this. I'm guessing it's all very specially clipped together as well, like the other ones have been. Not something you can just get apart. Definitely going to end up destroyed. There you go. Some clips have started. Okay, not too difficult. Okay, well let's take the panel out and take the hinges off. I wonder if this one will have an integrated LED driver or compact fluorescent or cold cathode fluorescent. There's Wi-Fi aerials at each side. I don't think this computer had Bluetooth, did it? Didn't appear to. Not in an obvious way that we could see. There's a magnet there. 
There must be a, a reed switch on the a hall switch on the main board. Where would that have been? It'll be that. I think it would have gone that way, like that. And right there where the magnet is, is this little thing. That will be a hall sensor. So it can tell when you shut the lid. I haven't found an exact match for that. Found pictures of it. Okay, well, that's a hall sensor. That's what we've learned there. So that will sense the magnetic field coming off this magnet when the lid's shut. And then it can go to sleep or turn off the light, whatever it needs to do. Just looking at the display connector there. Would that be LVDS or EDP? This is four positions for inductors. But if it was display port, it wouldn't need that many pins or pairs. It'll be able to go with two pairs because it's a low resolution screen. So pretty sure it's LVDS. Yeah, the data rate of display ports pretty high. So you only need a couple of cores to do a low resolution screen like this, which is the reason why for that Lenovo display upgrade project, you had to use the dock display ports because the built-in one for the screen only had two pairs because the internal screen is always such a annoyingly low resolution. They really messed up on that one, putting such a poor screen in the computer. Otherwise perfect computer, the Lenovo X230. Could have been great, but they ruined it. I'm putting a bad screen in it. it. Should have been 1080. Would have been much better for the 12 inch size. Yeah, so there's the Wi-Fi aerials on this little screen thing, and here's a lid. It has some kind of weird sticky feeling coating on it, which is, you never clean it, it's pretty gross. It looks like some kind of resin stuff. Maybe it was available in different colors. Anyway, here's the panel. What manufacturer is that? Don't know. Here's the connector, again with some tape holding it on to make it difficult to remove. So this is still a good screen, so it's not broken yet. I wonder if we could join that into the Apple computers. Don't know what the point of that would be, but it looks like a similar match to this, except it probably isn't because this one had separate um, tube driver. Yeah, everything's different. You're never, never going to get one that matches and just plugs in. Anyway, let's look up the screen and see what that is. It's an LP, and there's two part numbers. That one there, that one there looks like an 8. LP 10.1 inches, probably. Yeah, 1336 by 768. Let's see if there's a data sheet available for this one. Or NEC, so it must be special for these computers. LVDS. Okay, it's got EDID on the screen, which is interesting for a LVDS one. Must have a uh, yep, LED backlight with built in driver. Pin out 3.3 volt power, 7 to 20 volt LED supply, PWM enabled. That's good because it's got all the bits and pieces integrated into it. I'm wondering, is this panel compatible with the one from the Lenovo X230? I'll just have a look. Okay, I don't have the original cable from the Lenovo computer, but I realize, of course, it's not going to work. It's not going to be the same because this is an LVDS display and the Lenovo one is EDP, Embedded Display Port. So there's no point thinking that this might work on one of the Lenovo computers. We took apart an NEC, whatever they called this thing, an Atom netbook thing, and it was quite interesting. Good stuff on the main board. And I think that concludes this series on tearing down old laptops. Maybe later I'll find some more to go through. But for now, that's it. Thanks for watching.